May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. We are informed at the start of chapter 12 of Luke that Jesus is addressing a crowd of thousands. Luke says it's a congregation so large that people keep stepping on each other. They're clamoring for the message, for the good word from him. Eventually a hush falls among them and the teacher steps forward. The whole of this 12th chapter is a slow building argument by Jesus. He keeps asking a sharp and possibly offensive question. Can't we be a little less concerned about everything in our lives? Maybe another way to say it is, what do we think we're accomplishing by spending so much time worrying? He develops this line of thought some, and then he asks us, look, if we can't, or excuse me, if we can learn to be less concerned about our lives as a whole, if we can learn how to do that, then can't we also learn to be less concerned about our possessions? As someone in my family once said about a sermon they'd heard, Jesus stops preaching and commences to meddling. He gets personal. He advocates a simpler, looser, freer way of looking at life where we can be freed from being overly attached to material things that weigh us down and keep us from being prepared to receive him and to share him. He wants us to understand how very little we actually need in this life. He says, show me what you treasure and I'll show you where your heart is. He tells that gigantic crowd and he tells us that when we know what we treasure, we can be thankful for it. And we can be freer and more generous in our love of the original giver. We can be generous back to God and to God's creation, to God's people. I'm sure you could tell me right away if I asked you, what is it that you treasure? Life? Family? Faith? Relationships? Friends? Home? good food, clothing, health, work. These are abstract ideas on paper or when I say them out loud, but of course for each one of us, they come with specific memories of images and people. Those memories may help us to feel warm and grateful. Sometimes, A lot of that specificity can come to rest in one tangible object that helps us to be connected to ourselves and to God and especially grateful for our lives. So although Jesus wants us to loosen up about having so many possessions, I think he would also say somewhat ironically, hold on to those small few things that keep you in that place of gratitude. And so I began to wonder, what are the tangible objects that people do genuinely treasure? And I asked, I asked a bunch of strangers and friends on the internet, what material objects are truly important to you and why? What things in your life contain the most meaning for you? So I thought people would say the typical things you always hear about, right? Family photos, wedding dresses, Bibles, etc. And there was some of that. But I also heard about novel objects of singular importance that anyone but the owner just wouldn't understand 
how important they are, not without hearing the story. I heard about a rocking chair, a baseball card, a quilt, a blue vase, a spinning wheel. I heard about a Green Lantern coffee mug, 15 years worth of journals, a statue of the Virgin Mary, a piece of quartz, and a recipe for biscuits. I heard about a college ring, cowboy cuffs, a basketball team photo, and a 1999 Ford Ranger pickup. Harness bells, a necklace with a locket and perfume inside. And I was even treated to a photo of something called potted meat food product. Of course, what makes that list of objects valuable is not the objects themselves, but the fact that they're so imbued with our stories and our memories, right? And a sense of who we are and where we come from. They're totems. They're, they're invested with the imprint of important people and moments in our lives. For uh, um, Kathy England, quote, this table slash desk was built by my great, great grandfather for his son's 10th birthday. Susan cherishes the wooden fork that her grandmother used to teach her how to make gravy. And that Ford Ranger, it isn't just any truck, it was Sean's father's truck. And to Sean, it represents 220,000 miles of life lessons, fishing, and the music of Linda Ronstadt, Patsy Cline, and Roy Orbison. And that isn't just any rocking chair. That was a gift from Kelly's grandmother to her when she was five years old. For Keith, that baseball card is, quote, the first really good baseball card I ever bought and collected with my own money. Kept it because it reminds me of the good old days, mowing yards to earn money so we could ride bikes to the store with friends, buy cards or candy or a Slurpee. For Tammy on the internet, quote, this vase was the only object my grandmother, who lived to be 103, had that belonged to her mother. It is a reminder of my place in the communion of saints. Granny was the one person who loved me exactly the way I was, never had to be good enough or smart enough, I was enough. One friend has a 10-pound rock that she carried for a mile when she was six years old. It reminds her of who she is, and I suspect her it reminds her of how strong she can be. And that isn't just any ring I mentioned before. That was John's dad's college ring. And those were Carl's great-grandfather's harness bells for his team, patented 1874. A can of potted meat was acquired on a trip that John made to Virginia with a best buddy in 1989. For Tracy, the smell of the perfume in the locket perfectly reminds her of her grandmother. I, I don't want to stop doing this. We could do this all day. But you get the idea, right? Anything can stand in for a specific memory or a specific place or people. Can instantly take us to a place and time that now maybe only exists in our minds and hearts, sights and sounds and smells. They evoke the important, the small, the unseen, moods and memories that are otherwise invisible. If you want to know what your heart's like, look at what you treasure. I have a rosewood pin that was given to me 
the day before I graduated from high school. It has been within easy reach almost every day of all those decades. Any thought worth putting on paper has gone through this pen. No other object so approximates and encapsulates my life. Holding on to these well-used and well-loved objects doesn't make us idolatrous. In fact, they point us toward God, toward generosity, hearts warmed up, ready to give. We are simply human beings. Humans look for meaning. We make symbols out of the common objects in our lives. We touch them and they transport us and they tell us without any words what's important, where our heart is, and who we are. They make the past real and they tell us how to live for today. You will meet some people in your life who will insist that nostalgia is toxic. I think Jesus has something to say about that. If you find the thing that is precious to you, it's okay to hold on to it. So if you want to know your heart, just go home and look around. Touch the things you see. Remember what they stand for. Get connected with yourself and with God. Be grateful.